Uh, my name is Demi Oyabanji. I'm sitting here with Christina Sazwa, and we're gearing up for our talk about superfan funnels and the best practices on how to build them. Um, a little bit more about myself. I am the Director of Creator Success at Riff. Uh, Riff is the technological infrastructure for the music entrepreneur platform. Um, essentially, what I do is help determine what the high impact actions and artists can take um, towards their goals are. Um, previously, I, I spent my whole life working in music. It feels like I grew up playing a lot of instruments. And then I went to college for um, popular music and consumer behavior at Western University before transferring to Berkeley, where I got my degree in music production. Um, ran a private label for some time, did some work uh, doing business development for local businesses in Toronto. Um, and just through that experience, I, I built all of the skills necessary to, I guess, learn on behalf of artists, which is what I'm doing now, and, and talk to experienced people like Christine and brilliant people who, um, you know, give me the, the, the guidance that I need to make the dis proper decisions for artists. So um, that's an intro to me. If you, if you want to learn more about me, come to my office hours, please. Um, yeah, I'm going to pass it off to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Demi. Hi, everybody. I'm Christine. It's lovely to be here. Um, I have been working in the music industry for most of my life as well. Um, I currently direct the director for strategy at um, the live music and travel company called Palin. Prior to this, I worked at Warner, Warner Music Group in, while in London. And prior to that, I was at Universal Music Group in Sweden. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, now live abroad in London. And I spent time working for labels, startups, live journalism and more within the music industry and I hold a degree in um, an MBA in marketing and a master's in data science. It's good to be here. Awesome, awesome. Um, and so today we're, we're talking about the super fan funnel and I think before we get into that um, it, it would be really helpful if you know we could go into why is a super fan funnel even necessary for an artist? Why is the concept of a funnel and of taking you know this large net of people that you get, you know, at the beginning and pushing them towards this thing. Why is it an important um, part of, a, of an artist's journey? And so I'll give my perspective first and then I'll pass it on to you. But, you know, the, the building a proper, you know, flow for the people who you're, who are interacting with your brand and the people who play such a fundamental role as the consumer part of your music business um, having a deliberate way of passing them on from place to place before they get to the final destination and that final interaction that is super important to you. Um, that's the point of a super fan funnel to me. So finding the, the next step from where you are to get your, your artists or your, to get your fans closer and closer and closer to that final destination. Um, how about yourself, Christine? Yeah, um, I think it's really important because there's not a one-size-fits-all strategy for an artist fan, uh, meaning that you would treat someone that's a super fan of you a lot differently than you're treating someone that maybe just started listening or, you know, just kind of has heard of you in passing. You have to treat those people that are super fans incredibly well because they make up usually the bulk of your listenership. They're the ones that repeat listen the most. They're the ones that listen on the first day. They're the ones that buy albums. They're the ones that spend actual money. Um, so it's incredibly important to think about, A, who those people are, B, how to reach them, and C, how do you get more people to that position? So it involves a combination of various marketing tactics as well as just communication and transparency with your, art, with your fans in order to be able to accomplish that. But I think it's the most important thing you can do as an artist is to build that funnel out and make sure that you have a continuous pipeline to actually get that, that audience you're looking for to that super fan stage. Absolutely. And I love I love the fact that you said, you know, it's not one size fits all, because the more that music expands and the more diversity we see in the industry and the more artists get creative about the ways they interact with their fans, the more that we truly see there is no way to be successful as a, as a musician. There are only goals and ways to achieve those goals. Um, so in that line, I, I think the first phase for an artist before you even start talking about 
defining your funnel is deciding who are these people that you're interacting with anyway. So let's talk a little bit about how to identify your fan base. Um, so on the Super Fan Builder tool, we have some insights that are helpful when it comes to identification of your fans. So we give um, data on gender. So we have them split in three categories right now. That's male, female, and non-binary. Um, and then even across those genders, we also have the age demographic. So um, who are your uh, male fans uh, that are between 25 and 34? And, you know, how much of your fan base do they make? And, you know, what, what, are, what are the things that are important to them? And so when it comes to demographic data, the important things to note is that, you know, especially when it comes to things like um, gender and age, they're not really a basket for you to throw your fans under and say, okay, because most of my fans are this age or because most of my fans are um, this gender, that dictates, you know, what they want or the way that they interact, because typically it doesn't. But what it can dictate is some of the things that might be important to them some of the things that are at the forefront of their digital interactions, what are the things that are popping up on their feed? Um, what are the things that are important to them socially? What's happening to them in terms of social justice right now? Um, what's important to them in terms of any movements, any trends? And so this helps you in terms of positioning your brand and saying, okay, I know that these are the majority of people that I'm speaking to, but I also know that because you fit within this demographic, um, this is the best way of me to position myself to you and to show you my value, depending on the things that I, uh, perceive as valuable to you. Um, and so that, that goes deeper when we go into things like interests. So you look at someone's interests and we also give that kind of data on the super fan builder. You look at their interests and you're able to see where is this person online? Because where do we go when we go into Instagram or TikTok? We go to find the content that interests us. We go look at the things that we want to learn more about, things that we want to edu be educated about, the things that we want to talk about. So understanding the interests of your fan base helps you know where to locate them, what things to talk about. Um, and then, you know, of course, location. So the physical location of your fan base helps you decide um, not only some cultural things, which are very location based, but also, you know, where should you be putting your paid marketing? Where is your conversion? Uh, where are your conversion metrics coming from? So where are people buying uh, the majority of their tickets? It should be the place where you have the most fans. So um, I think when it comes to building the, the perfect super fan funnel and, and understanding your super fans, I think identifying the demographics uh, comes first. Um, what do you think, Christine? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what you have said, definitely. I definitely think that you have to identify your fans before you can do anything else. So thinking about, yes, their interests. What I, what I always found really interesting is dur during the pandemic when it first started, um, people were struggling to find their audience and figure out where their fans were because people had a very shallow viewpoint of who their fans were. Meaning, you know, if you were a dance artist, like, oh, yeah, well, they love going to clubs. So it's like, well, the clubs are closed. Where are they now? Um, yeah. So if you don't fully understand who your audience is, you're not going to be able to reach them. Um, it can't be as shallow as, oh, you know, they like this type of music or they like go they live in these types of places because it goes much, much deeper than that. And if you're trying to identify them, win them over and things like that, you have to know what they're looking for um, and that will dictate all kinds of things. So that would dictate the type of content you make, who you might go on tour with, who you might collaborate with, what type of merchandise you release, you know, what ways people can interact with you, what platforms you're going to be on. It all determines about what your fans are doing. People often ask me, you know, um, should I be on, you know, TikTok? And I, my, my literal first question is, are your fans on TikTok? Um, the answer could be yes or no. And if your fans are on TikTok, then yeah, absolutely. If your fans are not on TikTok, then why? Um, if your target mm. audience isn't there and your fans aren't there, then why would you go to the trouble of adding another platform to your repertoire if you don't need to? So looking at literally, seriously, like looking at who your fans are, using things like Superfan Builder and also just like 
doing your own research, figuring out, you know, all the various platforms, like if you're on Spotify, look at your Spotify for artists. If you're on Apple, look at your, you know, Apple Insights, et cetera, and figure out, hey, cool, my fans on this platform are here. My fans on Patreon are over here. My fans on Twitter are over here. And hopefully you start seeing some patterns in some places where that overlaps. And those patterns, those places that overlap are the most important places to double down your efforts. Another thing I always tell people, especially when they're looking at um, information like location, is also make sure you understand contextually what that means. So, for example, a lot of times artists will say, oh, you know, I have tons of fans in the U.S., maybe I should tour there. And I always tell them to compare the audience they have in the U.S. with the overall population in the U.S. Is that still a significant percentage in comparison to, for example, your hometown or Europe or things like that? If it's still a significant percentage, then that's definitely something to consider. But if it's like 1% of the population, which is, you know, 3 million people in the U.S., then it might not be the best place for you to devote your energy right now. So being really clear about contextually what the data is telling you, not just the raw numbers, but really what that means in the context of everything else, um, I think it's very, very important to consider. And also one thing to think about is um, how things change over time or if things are kind of a flash in the pan. Um, you see a lot of artists that, you know, have a track that does very successfully on, you know, TikTok and they have one track with a billion streams and then the rest of the tracks with a million. There's nothing wrong with having a million streams. It's, it's great to have a billion streams, but really you don't want to revamp or cater yourselves to people that are temporarily going to be around. Again, focusing on who your super fans are is incredibly important. So the people that started with you are the people that are going to stay with you if you you know, nurture that relationship. So it could be a small amount of people, it could be a large amount of people, but you have to nurture that relationship to keep them because there's no point of gaining new fans while losing the old fans. Um, traditional marketing will tell you that it's cheaper to to maintain a customer than acquire a new customer. And if you think of your fans in the same way, keeping the people that love you around is much easier than trying to continuously build people or keep people around that may or may not be there for the long haul. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. And I think one of the, the, the I guess, pits that artists will fall into when they're looking at their data is you see all of these metrics, you see all of these people, but for an artist, you know, artists have been told over and over again what their high converting, you know, metrics are so what are your high impact metrics how many followers i have how much money i'm making um that kind of engagement how many streams i'm getting on spotify but i i think that creates a pit for artists to fall into because you're not really thinking okay what are the high impact interactions between myself and my fans so you know it could be you know if you were to draw a Venn diagram, one being yourself and then one being the people you're interacting with, you really need to understand what specifically falls in the middle. So, you know, what are the experiences that that audience requires that you can provide? What are the low shelf actions that they can take that will drive big momentum for you? And how can you drive them towards those actions? You know, so the the function of a marketing funnel or a super fan funnel is that you drive a brand new listener to take that first step by committing them to a small action and then naturally leading them to the next action and so on until they are like a fully engaged fan. Um, because, you know, at the beginning, when they're just finding your music, when they're just finding out your brand, they have no motivation for to do any of the high impact interactions, buy some merch, go to your show, do any of that. But they might have, you know, enough for them to, like a couple of your posts, comment, share. Um, so talking about how you can decide what interactions are important where and in what order um, is the purpose of a super fan funnel. So uh, when, when we talk about, I guess, funneling your fans, Christine, um, how do you see that, that funnel playing out for an artist? Yeah, um, I think... I think one thing that I always find really interesting is that a lot of people have kind of lost or maybe potentially never had the concept of how marketing overall works. Um, I think people inherently understand marketing, um, but when it comes to things that they are very close to, all of a sudden it feels like they've kind of lost that information. Mm -hmm. So um, what I mean is you might not be the target audience for your music. Um, I know that seems very obvious when I say it out loud, but I think sometimes people forget that. I remember I worked at a company once and, you know, someone that was like the brand owner for something, they said, you know, hey, you know, I never see our ads. And I said, well, 
you aren't the target audience for the ads if you saw the ads and I wasn't doing my job correctly. Um, and I think that's something that's really kind of lost on people when they think about, you know, oh, I remember talking to some people and they would say, hey, you know, um, a super fan would listen to a song the moment it was released and it said, it depends on who your fans are. Um, some super fans are very much like that. If you have, you know, if you're an artist like Justin Bieber or Five Seconds of Summer or even smaller artists, like smaller artists that have a certain sound, like, you know, um, pop artists, um, pop punk bands, etc., tend to have fans that like, yeah, they tend to like listen as soon as a song comes out. However, if you are an artist that has older fans, for example, if you're an artist that has fans that happen to be, you know, um, parents, for example, they're much less likely to listen up front. I, um, I remember doing some analysis and some studies around the space that I found that like there were some artists where they um, had a really strong overlap in kids' music. Um, uh, there were some audiences that had a really strong overlap in kids' music and I realized it's because they're parents and they were the ones that were most likely to take longer to listen to a new album when it was released. Um, so I laying that groundwork and that foundation to make sure that people kind of understand that when you're thinking about marketing, it's not what you like or your behavior or what you would do. It's more than that. It's much more than that. It's really what your fans are going to do, what your fans normally do and how they behave. There's some ways in which you can kind of co like coerce people um, to kind of change their behaviors, but you also have to kind of meet people where they are, mm -hmm. meaning you have to think really clearly about, hey, where are my fans? What are they doing? How are they going to behave? And then tailor to that not make them continuously kind of come to you because if you make them come to you, that's the way that you're going to lose the fans overall. In terms of the actual marketing funnel, um, if you think about it, there's like top of funnel. So like, you know, think my funnel shaped this way. The top of the funnel is, you know, the consideration stage. That's the part of the funnel where people are going to hear of your band for the first time or hear of your music for the first time. Maybe they heard it, you know, from a friend. Maybe it was through a sync. Um, maybe it was like just seeing your username on a platform like Twitter or TikTok or things like that. So that's the point in which people are just kind of figuring out if they actually care or if they like you or if they want to progress essentially with you in some way. So at that point, what you're kind of thinking about is making sure that when when that person has the opportunity to find you, A, you make it easy for them to continue to find you, meaning there's more for them to dig into and more for them to discover. Let's say they hear you know, a, a song, then when they go on Spotify, for example, or Apple, is there more music for them to consume? Um, if there's not music for them to consume there, um, what about on YouTube? Have you put a, additional content up around that song? For example, have you done things like done a behind the scenes uh, or a making of or a lyric video or you know explanation of why you put the other song something like that to provide more content to people so that they can continue down the funnel essentially so at the top of the funnel we're looking at consideration um, at the very bottom of the funnel you're looking at you know loyalty and conversions and things like that and in between there's these steps where people are taking from hey I'm considering you as an artist to you know oh I'm aware of you as an artist um, which is you know They've heard one song, maybe they've heard two now, maybe they could recognize your name when someone says it. They probably wouldn't say, oh, I love that artist or I love that band. They might say, oh, yeah, I've heard of them. So what your job then is, is like, oh, you've heard once or twice. Then it's figure out, hey, how do I continuously reach that person? Meaning, oh, they listened once and they've consumed whatever I had the first time. So like, how do I come get them to come back again? So there's a few different ways you kind of approach that, for example. Um, one could be, you know, an email list. Um, one could be a contest that you put out. Um, one could be, you know, having your own, um, like landing page. So, you know, when you go link in bio, making sure that you have all your tracking in place so you can like run a targeted ad later or something like that. So there's a few different ways that you can, um, kind of go about things. Um, but there's that point of like making sure that you can find them again, because, you know, super fandom isn't built in a single session. Um, a lot of marketing studies find that it takes seven touch points for someone to actually convert. Um, and the more expensive or more time consuming that, con that conversion is, the longer it generally takes and actually the more potential advertising or, you know, um, expenditure it takes to do that conversion. Um, and so when you think about seven touch points from a, you know, a music standpoint, that might be, you know, seven different tracks released, um, but you can see up that process if it's, you know, four tracks released and three really cool, you know, um, music videos that you also put out or, you know, five tracks release and, you know, two really great emails offering a discount on the web store, for example. Now, people that are just kind of considering you um, are not going to probably go to your web store quite yet, but that's when you get to that conversion stage. 
um, that conversion stage is when people go from like, oh, hey, I've heard that band, to like, yeah, I like that band, you know, I'm going to be willing to buy a concert ticket, or I'm going to be willing to buy merch. And what that might look like, or one way for conversion is like, if you're really listening to your fans, really listening to what they want, you might identify artists that they really love in addition to you, especially if there's artists that are similar size in their career, like a similar point in their career as you. That's a good opportunity for a collaboration or a tour together. And so that conversion is probably much more likely to happen because you double down on the same fan twice, essentially. If they're like, oh, I love this artist and I love you. Um, oh, yeah, I'll go to that concert because I'm getting two for the price of one, essentially. Or, you know, definitely I'm going to check out that song. And I'm going to tell my friends about it because it's two artists that I really like, for example. That's how you convert them into like that super fan phase because essentially, even unconsciously, they're, you're, they're thinking, hey, this artist really knows what I want as a super fan. They know that I want to hear this type of music. I want to see this type of tour. I want to see this type of merch. Um, I find it really fun when artists do kind of like almost like inside jokes with their fans where like no one else would really get it for like merch or things like that, but like their fans definitely would. So for example, um, when I worked at Warner, um, there was a, you know, Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion released a track in a WAP. Um, and one of the merch items for that was like umbrellas and like raincoats. Uh, it's a really funny joke if right. you understand what WAP actually stands for, obviously. Um, but things like that, I think, is a really tongue in cheek way to reach your super fans. People that are not super fans probably didn't find that particularly funny and probably didn't buy the merch. But if you're like a really big fan and love it, that, like that's exactly what you're looking for. And that's who you need to tailor merch to anyway, because like, you know, the person that just heard her song for the first time isn't going to be buying the merch anyway. And then once you get down to like the retention phase, that's where you have to keep your super fans. And that's why I meant why I said it's much more expensive to convert a new fan than to keep the fans that you already have. So that's when you do things to appeal to them as super fans. You know, make sure that you acknowledge them. Make sure you, um, if they're on your email list and they've been on your email list for five years, make sure you send a little note, like a personalized note, even if you're a small enough artist, and say, hey, you know, thank you so much for all your support. They're going to absolutely love that. They're going to screenshot and send it to all of their friends and post it on social media. Um, and that leads to the advocacy where they become your marketing machine. Essentially, they start doing all that heavy lifting for you. If you think about artists like, you know, BTS, and they have the BTS army. They run as an autonomous unit to get their artists on the charts, to get them playing in radio stations, to get collaborations, you know, things like that. They work as a entity. And so if you get to the point, even at a small scale of like having fans that like are your biggest fans, that's super important. I think one really cool way that I've seen people approach this is to have like a little like um almost like a focus group of super fans. And, you know, they might they might be their core fans, you know, and they send them, you know, an email every couple months and say, Hey, what do you think about this? or who do you want to see me collaborate with next? Or who do you want, what type of merch are you looking for? Et cetera, et cetera. Or where they build that idea of the fans being a part of the journey and a part of the artist's experience with them. And that's what helps with that retention and that advocacy. So when you start from awareness and you get all the way down to advocacy, that's the super fan funnel. And it starts with a wide, wide swath and net all the way down to that very core important people that you have to make sure you always keep in your corner because they're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you as you grow as an artist. Amazing, amazing. Um, I, I think the the one thing I would also add is that you know this funnel isn't like a it's not like a top to bottom process where you know you have your awareness running and then you move everybody to the next phase to the next phase to the next phase. It's sort of like you're you have some people who will you know go from the awareness phase to the next phase and then you'll need to send them back so they won't interact with that many touch points so forget about the brand so you'll need to rescoop them from the awareness phase again maybe send them down a different funnel maybe you tried to send them down your content funnel on tiktok and instagram maybe that didn't really work maybe they're more of a a, a music connection so if you try again spotify uh, funnel um, try and get them into your streams get them into your listings get them into your merch get them into your shows um, that is another super fan funnel where you're starting again from the awareness phase and you're trying to bring them but then you also have like you said like retention where you convert a fan and then you sort of take them back into the engagement phase and then convert them again and then engagement conversion and engagement conversion so you sort of retain their attention by continuously giving them things to engage with and different touch points to to enter so um i think that's i think that's perfect as long as artists sort of understand that you, you it's sort of a consistent cycle uh this funnel so it's not top down it's sort of like you're continuously running people through your your super fan funnel or super fan funnels yeah i think that's a really excellent point because i think something that's inherent it's inherent with music is the fact that you're 
like they call it a cycle for a reason. There's some artists that have an always on strategy, meaning they're releasing music pretty much consistently every, you know, six to, you know, every three to six months. Um, But most, um, I wouldn't say most, but like some artists are on a cycle, meaning they are album artists. Think of like an Adele, for example, Adele's very much an album artist where you have to tell people albums coming out, talk about the album that's coming out, put the album out, do a press circuit where you talk about the album that's come out. And those are all examples of those various touch points that you're going through as a artist to make sure you meet your fan. Same thing if you're a um, an artist that tours quite frequently. There's every time, hey, there's a tour that's going to come. You know, hey, the tour is at- happening now. Here, get some footage from the tour. Hey, you know, make sure you buy your ticket for the tour, et cetera, et cetera. Where there's all these different touch points again, um, because a lot of what it comes to music is very cyclical. Because you literally are releasing music, and then you need to make sure people are aware of the music and convert on the music, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much not like a like. It takes work, and just because someone is a super fan now doesn't mean they're always going to be one, and just because they're a super fan doesn't mean they're going to listen on day one, and all the different components, so you have to make sure that you're, again, meeting them where they are, essentially. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think the, the next phase here is to just go a little deeper into, um, I guess, moving moving a fan from one phase to the next. So we, we spoke about that first phase of consideration where um, it's sort of like their, their first touch point with your brand. Um, And then you're trying to get them from there to a place where they're consistently engaging. So what are some of the strategies, you know, as an artist, if I have, you know, um, so I know my audience, I know where they're at, but I'm just unable to take them from that phase where they hit those first few touch points and I really need them to start engaging. What are some of my um, strategies, you think? Yeah, so I think one thing you have to be very cognizant of is an understanding of where people become aware of you. Um, there's probably a lot of different places where that happens. There's some things that you can figure out pretty easily. So, for example, if you look at your Spotify for artists, you can see, you know, first playlists that, you know, people are discover on, discovering you on and things like that. Um, sometimes it might be a little tougher. Um, it could be radio. It could be through a friend or things like that. But you have to think a bit about where people are finding you because that's help, going to help you determine what the next step should be. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, I've seen examples where um, a track has gone viral on TikTok and then they um, basically re-release the track and put the part of the name of the song that has gone viral on TikTok in, um, on TikTok in the name of the song. For example, um, Tone Tonight, Dance Monkey. Um, is a track in which she ever never actually says the words dance monkey mm-hmm. the actual lyrics are dance for me um and so there was a point in time in which on tiktok if you looked for it you couldn't find it because people were like looking for like dance for me um and then they changed you know to add parentheses of dance for me um so an example like that like that awareness consideration because the consideration phase when people go from like oh cool i heard that track to hey i might want to use this on tiktok or hey i might want to find this off platform is really important um, mm-hmm. Another example might be if you have a really great sync, it could be a small sync or a big sync, sync meaning like your song is playing in the background of a TV show, a movie, an advertisement, et cetera, essentially. If that were to be the case, you then have to think about, cool, you know, what happens when someone tries to figure out that's me? So if you kind of, you know, if you take a clip of that and post it on your YouTube channel and say, yo, do you see me in, you know, on the Toyota ad or do you see me, or et cetera, et cetera. And so when people go on YouTube to find that song or that sound, they find you. Basically, you have to make it very easy for people to find you. Once they get from the awareness stage to the consideration stage, it's figuring out how to make it very, very easy for people to find you and consume more. I always recommend that people, for example, have a playlist that has their full discography. Um, so if, and you can, one thing that's really great about that is that you can rank it in any order you want. If you want it in album order, if you want it in some fun, like, you know, like history of you order, et cetera, et cetera, you can do that. But allowing it so like there's very, very easy modes of consumption is really, really important. Making sure you're on all of the DSPs is also very important because everyone picks, you know, listens into various places. And especially making sure you're on YouTube because YouTube is the biggest streaming service in the world. It is one of the very few streaming services that you do not need a login to use, essentially. You can just Google a song and then all of a sudden you're on YouTube. So making sure that as many of your songs as possible are on YouTube is incredibly important because that's how people, that's how some people consume music entirely. And it's, it's really important to make sure you're there. So that will help you figure out from awareness to consideration with essentially this idea of how are people finding you? How are people becoming aware? And how easy are you making it for them to consider, you know, consuming more of you essentially. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Because I, one of the major things that um, I talked to artists about this year that um, I was shocked that not a lot of people do is searching yourself and searching your stuff up on, on socials and on Google to see how far you come up. Because a lot of times artists will realize, okay, so if I type in the first four letters of my username right now, I actually come up ace. But if I make this slight change to my username, which you know is still on brand and is still recognizable, um, then when I type in the first three letters, I'm actually second. Um, so I'm not competing with that many people or I'm, I'm coming up on top of the people that I'm competing with. So keeping track of, yeah, how easy it is to people for people to find me on, on platforms. Um, how, how am I doing on searches? What are my profile views? Are they up or are they down? Where are people coming from? Um, looking at all of that on, on not only, you know, Spotify for artists, but look at your Instagram insights, look at your Spotify insights and use the super fan builder. Um, because you know, we, we would display all of these for you in, in the individual phases, but, um, even when you're doing your own analysis, you know, find those first touch points and think dynamically about how many places are, you know, really the first interaction someone could have with your brand think about all of the places that they could hear you see you all of the promotions that you're doing um the posters that you put up around town think about all of those connection points and where the next step is for them so i think that's that's definitely great i definitely definitely very much agree um i love the idea of thinking about just like straight up seo i think that's an idea that like again when people think about marketing they forget about the basics and mm -hmm. seo is a really really great basics to think through um especially if you think about the fact that youtube is owned by google so it's inherently an seo platform and if you mm -hmm. take that into account you should be continuously thinking about hey what am i ranking what, what does the rank look like for me and if as an artist you don't have time to do that definitely use tools that are available to you to make sure that it's done for you so that you're not you're not losing fans just because like they're not you're not search, they're not searching the right search term right that's a that's a really bad reason to lose fans essentially absolutely especially because you know the language analysis on most major platforms right now it, it goes deeper than you know your name and your your bio even it goes into the captions of all the videos you put up and uh, the comments under your videos in order for the the platforms to dictate what is this piece of content about and who is it relevant to so you know make sure that you're using very descriptive language make sure that you know you're adding the links in the right places and um, keep track of what works for you and what works for your fans and what doesn't. Um, and that puts you in a way better position to make the kinds of decisions as, you know, um, should I tag my collaborators in the bio of my YouTube video or in the comments? What's higher converting for you? What's higher converting for them? Um, so getting the answers to those kinds of questions will always uh, guide you better than um, what I see a lot of artists try to do which they, they call feeling the vibe i think vibe is an overused word so i would just call it feeling it out like where you're just sort of playing it by ear and seeing okay this works this sort of works but you're not basing it on anything so um the the benefit of data is consistency uh and data doesn't lie so consistency and honesty is the benefit that you have so using that to your best advantage would would just be you know tracking it and coming up with some personal insights as well as following the the super fan builder insights on the platform. Mm -hmm, definitely. I, um, I definitely agree. And I think sometimes people are really intimidated by the, like the phrase data, um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be intimidating. Um, you can run an experiment and it doesn't have to be like, you know, you have to pull out a spreadsheet for it. Literally you can say, cool, for this track, I put all of my hashtags, in, I put a bunch of hashtags in, that I see it perform better than this track that I did put a bunch of hashtags in. You can run your own little experiments and just literally look, hey, did I get more clicks? Did I get more views? Did I get more listeners? Did I get whatever, more of whatever, essentially? And just do these little experiments to try things out. You don't have to be a data scientist to like understand and use data a bit just to say, hey, I have a hypothesis, you know, I have a theory, I'm just going to play it out, essentially. Um, I think that really leads to like thinking about that conversion and um, to retention kind of pipeline, essentially. Um, like we talked through it a bit, but really that's the point. That's when that's kind of the most critical point that you have with a fan is 
hey, I need to get this person that's a super fan to stick around for a very long time, essentially. Um, and the best or best way you're thinking about what the ROI is for a fan, but a fan is also at this point very much thinking about what the ROI is for being a fan. Basically, like, and what I mean by that is, you know, you're getting value out of the fan because they might be, you know, buying merchandise, streaming music, but also, you know, they're really supportive, you know, they're that, that, that network that you've developed for yourself as an artist. But on the flip side, fans also has an ROI when they think about being a fan, meaning, you know, am I investing a lot in this artist that's not, that doesn't care about me, you know, or am I investing a lot in this artist and they're making their ticket prices much higher than my, you know, my average income? Um, do I care a lot about this artist and they never come to my town? You know, all these different things where they kind of think, oh, this person might not actually care about me or care about the people like me and things like that you know i know some artists that were really hesitant or really um, dismissive of tiktok even though they had a huge fan base there and like it's not like the fans aren't stupid they noticed that you know that you've dismissed the platform that they use most frequently um and if they feel that you find the way they interact with you silly um they're going to notice that and move on to an artist that doesn't feel that way you know i've seen a lot more success with artists that even if they're not comfortable getting on tiktok they might like i've seen people incorporate tiktok choreography um into like a live set and it's really cool like and like if you were not a fan that was a tiktok fan you probably wouldn't even notice but if you were um that's just like that, that little call out that says hey i acknowledge you and i know that you're important to me essentially so if you think about that that's what that conversion to retention pipeline looks like is that acknowledgement of your fan community and making sure that you meet them where they are, wherever that might be. If you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself for whatever reason, thinking about how how you can do that for them. I think a really prime example of that is like Beyonce. Beyonce is not really active on socials. So that's not really what she does. However, she performed at Coachella and then built, did a whole documentary called Homecoming about HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. She didn't attend one, but she knows she has a really strong fan base of people that did attend them. And that was just a love letter to the fans. Like that whole thing was a love letter to the fans. If you think about it, like an entire HBCU set at Coachella is definitely not a broad appeal situation. And so the people that were going to be most captivated by that were going to be the super fans. And like thinking about those kind of things where if you don't feel comfortable, for example, being on socials or you don't feel comfortable doing certain things, it's, hey, what do I know about my fans and how can I accommodate them in a way that I feel comfortable that I know is going to be giving back to them as well. And if you can't think about everything from the lens of what's the ROI from a fan's point of view, that will really help you from that conversion to retention and even to that advocacy stages. If you're giving back to them, they're going to want to continue to give back to you. It's a symbiotic relationship. And if you mm -hmm. neglect the fact that it's a symbiotic relationship, you're not going to be able to maintain those fans. Absolutely. And and being a fan of, uh, of visual metaphors, I'm going to draw that Venn diagram again and um, just sort of to help artists understand, you know, you do have that Venn diagram of things that you're comfortable with and you're interested in and things that your fans are interested in. But I, I don't, the one thing that I don't think artists understand is that 90% of your marketing happens in that middle portion. So it's not you doing the things that interest you and then wherever the overlap happens is great. It's like you are making that overlap happen. And then sometimes things might bleed out and not fit into the overlap on either end. So it might be more for the fans, more for you, but a majority of your focus, even if that overlap is tiny, a majority of your focus is happening in that overlap. Um, so your effort, your money, your time, um, that's where artists, where, that's where fans really want to see you. And so that's where artists really need to populate their energy. Absolutely. I love that metaphor of like the, the Venn diagram because that's exactly how it works as a fan, as a fan and an artist is like that symbiotic relationship happens in that center point. And if you can um, use that center point well, it's really important. And if you are willing to expand your comfort zone, the fans are going to be willing to expand their comfort zone as well. If you think about artists that kind of just got basically weirder over time um it's because they prep their fans for it you know their fans are willing to follow them on whatever journey that they had been decided to, to take on essentially mm -hmm. um if you think about the progression i'll use beyonce as an example again but if you use the progression from like you know birthday and things like that all the way to like lemonade that's an entirely different artist but there is that transition point where the fans are willing to go go there with her because there's this amount of vulnerability, there's amount of giving back, there's a amount of like that fan ROI essentially. And so your fans are going to be willing to come with you on a journey if they feel like 
you're taking them with like you're taking them with you rather than you're forcing them to go somewhere essentially so to continuously thinking about that idea of hey we are both have our comfort zones we need to stretch out of it together is a much better way to approach things than like going completely left field you know you've, you've heard about artists that are like yeah for my first album i did this and i completely changed sound and genre because i and then you're like oh but the fans that you already had were not you didn't acquire any new fans you lost all those fans too Mm -hmm. it's really great to want to try a new sound or want to try you know a new collaboration a new producer whatever it might be but make sure that you're bringing those fans on a journey with you so explain why you did it you know what you're meant to get out of it make sure that you have something that sounded similar to what you did before and then make that transition rather than like trying to do a stark transition because it really just alienates your fans and Mm -hmm. if they don't understand why then there's there's no reason for them to want to come along with you on that journey essentially Mm, yeah phenomenal phenomenal this has been fantastic christine um i have run out of notes to keep us going here but uh if there was anything else that you wanted to like any other tidbits of information you wanted to drop for artists now's the time to do it before i wrap us up here oh gosh no pressure right no um, i think (laughs) i think honestly like i think a lot of artists just inherently know what to do and sometimes they just kind of get wrapped up in other things So if you're wrapped up in how many streams you've got or how many playlist positions you've got or, you know, what chart position you're at, you stop thinking about the fans. You start thinking about, you know, vanity metrics, essentially. Just think about who your fans are, who your audience is, Um, not because you need to always cater to your fans, but really it's more so you started doing this for a reason. And that reason wasn't to be on today's top hits. That reason wasn't to be at the top of the chart. You know, you started doing this for a much more, a much stronger reason than that. And if you go back to that core idea, I'm sure giving back your fans, the community, et cetera, are all a part of that. And so removing the idea of, oh, I need to make a you know, billion streams and thinking much more about, you know, I need these super loyal fans, then I think that will take a really long way. You know, it's entirely possible to have a long, strong and sustainable career without ever making on the chart. Because if you have fans that are willing to purchase merchandise, if you have fans that are willing to subscribe to your Patreon, fans are willing to buy concert tickets, etc., you can still be a really lucrative and successful artist without having to always be on the charts or be in playlists and things like that. And so like keeping in mind what's most important to you as an artist rather than what looks good as an artist, I think is really, really what everything we've said today comes down to. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, and I think to uh, wrap us up here, um, using the the main draw the main draw of this conversation for me was that um, we got to show the artist that using the super fan builder is a good um, it's a good tool for you to use in order to understand your super fans in order to interact better with your super fans, but the real quality assurance is your you know understanding and interaction of those super fans so um creating those unique touch points those unique experiences and understanding exactly what it is that your fan base is coming to you for as an artist um so my hope is that that's what the artists have learned from this conversation um christine so thank you so much for your time um i know the artists are thinking 45 minutes but i we both know how much time you've given to me especially in the development of this tool so thank you so much for your time beginning to end and in totality um i really appreciate this conversation of course it's been great um and i'm so excited to, to see how this is used and how you guys are able to help out all of these artists and musicians